What's up Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto is overpowered early. Summary, what if Mizuki tries to trick Naruto several years earlier, unlocking a seal, unleashing Naruto's full potential, and his inheritance. Chapter 5 It had been seven days since the meeting between Gyuki and Kyare, and everyone was dense. They were expecting Zabuza to be back today, only this time they would be fighting several others as well. Naruto Remembering the information that Ino had gained from mind-walking the now-dead demon brothers, had claimed that if Aoi Rokusho showed up, then he was his to kill, but in doing so he would have to leave his friends to face the others for at least a short amount of time. Naruto was also considering making a proposition to Zabuza after he was done with the Konoha traitor, that of recruiting Zabuza and Haku into Konoha, which would allow them to go about their business without fear of Kiri's hunter nins. However it would depend on the personalities of both of the former Kiri Shinobi. As the large group of Konoha and Kumo Nin set off towards the bridge with Tazuna, they left behind a group of Shadow Clones and Lightning Clones to guard Tazuna's family while they were guarding him. Never know how far Gato will stoop, although he had already stooped far enough. As the large group approached the end of the bridge connected to Wave, everybody tensed as they saw the mist hanging over the worksite in the middle of the bridge obscuring their view of the workers. Naruto and Kanako figured that this was Zabuza's jutsu due to the chakra lacing the mist, and Naruto stepped forward before using a high-level wind jutsu to dissipate the mist. Six figures were revealed, one obviously being Zabuza, due to his massive Zanbadu over his shoulder, and another being Aoi, due to the sparking sword that seemed to be made of lightning in his hand. As the two groups of shinobi walked towards each other, Kurunai told Tazuna to stay back and assigned her team to watch over him. So it seems that we have a chance to fight once more, Konoha's deathly angel, Zabuza said in a scathing tone as he looked at Naruto. Well, his attitude is pointing at him not accompanying us to Konoha, Naruto thought grimly. Be that as it may Zabuza, but I shall have to have my fight with Aoi Rokuso over there before we do, Naruto said, motioning with his head to the thief of the Raijin no Ken. And why are you interested in battling me, brat? Are you foolish enough to think you can beat the wielder of the Raijin no Ken? The lightning sword of the Naidaim Hokage? Aoi asked arrogantly, thinking that once the brat heard of the sword's past he would back off. I will kill you for taking the property of the Senju clan, which is related to mine own, Naruto said, voice chilling quickly as he narrowed his eyes dangerously. The Konoha ninja, especially those from Team 7 and the two Jounin, knew that when Naruto was acting like this, he was officially pissed. Well, I insist that we fight before you take him on. Zabuza was not happy at being disregarded for someone as arrogant as Aoi. If you insist, then I shall take you both on, as I will not let the thief escape. His life is forfeit, Naruto said, glaring at the two of them. Bloody missing nin making my life more difficult due to their stubborn pride, Naruto thought, rather irritated that Aoi wasn't dead yet. As Naruto, Zabuza and Aoi were arguing over the order of their fights, the Kumo team and Team 7 had spread themselves in front of the other missing nin, each choosing their own combatant. Kurunai, Kakano and B stayed back, ready to help the Jinan if necessary but also saving their energy in case it was needed later. Hearing Naruto's proclamation about taking on both Zabuza and Aoi, everyone looked over at the boy, shocked that he first challenged Aoi to their battle, but now he was taking both of them? Who in their right mind disadvantages themselves when faced with two A-ranked missing nin? Well, Naruto does. As Naruto, Zabuza and Aoi began to stare at one another. Aoi began to wonder why Zabuza had not activated his hidden mist jutsu yet. As he turned towards Zabuza slightly in order to ask that very question, Zabuza answered, Doesn't work, tried it already, but the brat is a sensor, and a very good one at that he could tell when I was making a water clone while in the mist. Slightly unsettled by this information, Aoi turned back to Naruto, who had drawn his twin ninja toes and was beginning to form his two wings behind him. The Sundaime Hokage and Naruto had realized that Naruto did it almost subconsciously in a fight, and on many missions while his clone was at the academy, Naruto had to wear seals in order to stop it from happening, in order to stop other villages identifying him as Konoha's deathly angel. Aoi and Zabuza looked on as Naruto directed small amounts of his chakra to the seals on the blades of his ninjutos. All of a sudden the right one seemed to gain a field of lightning around it while the left did the same with wind, as one could see tiny bladed shapes swirling around the blade. When Zabuza saw this his eyes widened, if a person took a full-on hit from that blade it would cut its way though their body, as the small blades of wind would grind away at an opponent's flesh, just at high speed. Meanwhile Aoi dismissed the two elementally covered swords, thinking that they were but a pale imitation of the Raija no Ken and as such, were incomparable in terms of sheer power. Naruto watched as the two missing nin drew their blades, Zabuza with his Kubi Kirobocho, and Aoi with the Raijin no Ken. He noted that even though Zabuza was treating him warily, Aoi was completely and utterly relaxed, 
as he had come to rely on the blade of the Nidime too much. Although it hadn't failed him yet, his arrogance allowed him to think it would never do so, and that would give Naruto a huge advantage. Knowing that it was time to stop stalling, Naruto disabled his weights and resistance seals and shot forward. Next millisecond, Naruto had had both of his attacks blocked by the blades of the two missing nins, he grinned quickly before disappearing in a blur of speed. Zabuza swore, Naruto hadn't been that fast before, and he had barely held out against him then, although he had only survived due to Haku's intervention. He swore louder. With Yugito and Sai, Yugito and Sai had decided to team up with each other and take on Zabuza's accomplice, although Sai was intending to put forward Naruto proposition after he had defeated her. Yugito had just teamed up with him as she knew that the remainder of her team and Ino would be able to handle the missing nin from Ame. I hope that you can cover being a close quarters fighter, Sai said as he turned to Yugito. Don't worry about that, Yugito replied, still looking at the girl that was facing them. In response Sai said nothing, just took out an art book and started to mold chakra in order to bring his drawings to life. Haku watched as various creatures of what seemed to be ink raced towards her. In response she summoned a huge amount of ice senbone from the river running below them and shredded the creatures with extreme prejudice. Yugito cursed, this may be harder than they thought if she had an ice bloodline. Sai looked unsurprised, but instead more determined, as he could see that Zabuza regarded her as a tool. This may be my chance to do for another person what Naruto did for me all those years ago, Sai thought determinedly. With Ino and the Kumo team, Ino watched as she and the Kumo team spread themselves out in a line facing the three Ame missing nin. Samui and Amoe had chosen their own targets, the oldest, a girl, and a person who looked to be a little more than a boy, but if he was a missing nin then it was likely he had a trick up his sleeve. Meanwhile she and Kura had silently agreed to work together to take down the last opponent, a tall male teenager, who looked rather haunted. As she watched Kuro streak towards their opponent in order to engage him in Kenjutsu, she sensed that Samui and Amoe were doing the same. Ino smiled slightly before shun shining behind the missing nins. Karu brought up her katana in order to try a downward strike at the silent teen, but at the very last second it seemed that the teen had brought a kunai up and blocked the strike. His seemingly dead green eyes gazed into Kuro's golden ones, shocking her. She brought back her katana for another strike, which was again blocked by the teen's kunai. Realizing that just using her katana was getting her nowhere and simply tiring her out, Kuro retreated slightly before channeling lightning chakra to her blade. She then moved back in to attack the teen and Kenjutsu once more. However before she could do so the teen faded from her sight. Genjutsu, Kuro thought worriedly, she never really bothered with Genjutsu. However before she could focus her chakra and disrupt the Genjutsu she felt the impact of a kunai to her temple, and everything went dark. Over in their fight Samoe and his opponent were at a standstill, as both seemed equal in their Kenjutsu, while Samui had gained a clear advantage over her enemy, having cut through the tendons in her left arm. Meanwhile Ino was considering how to defeat her opponent now that Karu is clearly out of action. Thankfully, having three on the level or higher teachers meant that she was pretty capable in all areas that she used. With the Jounin Senseis, all three of the Jounin Senseis watched the fights in front of them, Naruto was doing well against the two A-rank missing nin, it was the other two fights that they were worried about. As such Kakano was left to make sure Naruto wasn't harmed too badly, while B watched over Yugito and Sai, while Kur and I watched Ino and the remains of the Kumo team. Kurunai collected the now unconscious Kur off the field as Zena moved in to combat the tall missing nin, and prepared herself to intervene should Ino prove to be losing. She was more concerned about Ino as Samui seemed to be taking care of herself, and Amoe had his opponent on the defensive. Although she did raise an eyebrow when she saw Ino focus chakra to what looked to be a seal on her wrist and grab the chokudo that had appeared. With Naruto, Naruto winced as Aoi prepared to try and stop his movement with the Raijin no Ken, you think the idiot would have learned by now. Naruto had spent the last few minutes running circles around the two swordsmen, and eventually Aoi had got annoyed and relied on the Raijin no Ken to try had stopped him. It hadn't worked, and Naruto was still winning, both Zabuza and Aoi bore various scuff marks and cuts, while Naruto had none. Seeing a chance to finally end Aoi as he turned the wrong way, Naruto ran up behind him, little more than a blur, and kicked Aoi's knees from behind. And as Aoi fell backward slightly Naruto used one of his ninjato and separated the traitor's head from his body. Zabuza watched on as Naruto gathered the Nidime Hokaiye's blade and Aoi's head and sealed them away within a sealing scroll, before readying himself as Naruto turned to him. Naruto looked at Zabuza evenly. Zabuza, I would like to make you a proposition, Naruto said. Why on earth would you make me a proposition, when we both know you can easily kill me and take my blade? Zabuza asked grudgingly admitting that Naruto was superior. I am not interested in Kubi Kirobocho, instead my offer is to recruit both you and your accomplice, Haku into Konoha, 
as Haku is not the last of his clan and has family there, Naruto said, slightly angry by the fact that Zabuza considered his sword over his accomplice. Why would your cage want either of us? It would bring nothing more than trouble for Konoha and Haku would be treated as little more than a breeding machine for your power-hungry civilians. In fact, how the hell do you even know of Haku, as you have never met him apart from that small encounter where he acted as the hunter nin, Zabuza refuted. One of our number is a Yamanaka, who retrieved the information from the demon brothers before they died, Naruto said shortly liking this man less and less. But you would rid me of my weapon if he accompanied you to Konoha, Zabuza said, finally stating that he saw Haku as nothing more than a weapon. Naruto didn't respond, blurring behind Zabuza. If you won't allow me to take him, then I shall ask him myself, Naruto said harshly into the missing Ninzir. You will have to kill me before I allow you near him, Zabuza said, turning, with his blade sweeping around. And you can't stop me from doing so, Naruto said Ninjatos at the ready. Ah, but you aren't the only one wearing chakra weights, Zabuza said, and with a burst of chakra, release them. Naruto and Zabuza re-engaged with blurs of speed causing sparks to fly from their colliding blades. With Sai and Yugito, Yugito cursed. If there is one thing I can say about this girl, she thought frustrated, it's that her use of ice makes it really hard to deal with her. I mean, waves of ice scene bonds, and now this mirror dome jutsu? Along with the fact that she can do one-handed seals, and she is a pretty nasty surprise. Sai was in a slightly better condition, being outside of the dome, and was considering when he was going to put forward Naruto's proposition as the fake hunter Nin was more difficult to defeat than he had anticipated. His thoughts were put on hold as he felt Yugito accessing her by Jua's chakra. Well, this will make defeating the accomplice easier, but I will need to use one of Naruto's seals to stop Yugito from killing the girl, Sai thought reaching into a vest pocket for a sealing tag. Sai watched as Yugito began to smash the ice mirrors forming the dome, eventually reaching the last one and shattering it, causing Haku to fall out of it with a cry of pain. As Yugito stepped forward to punch Haku into oblivion, Sai blurred behind the bijou feed Kunoichi and put Naruto's sealing tag on the back of her neck, causing Yugito to go unconscious and forcing the Baijuu's chakra into its seal. Haku looked up at Sai, before saying, You know, there is nothing I hate more than traitors. I am not betraying her, but I need to put forward a proposition from my teammate, and she was about to crush you, Sai said calmly, laying Yugito out in a more comfortable position. Such would be my punishment for failing Zabuza-sama, and all propositions that you have for me should go to him as he is my master, Haku said, pulling off her hunter and mask and revealing to Sai that he was in fact a boy. It does not necessarily concern Zabuza, as he may be dead by now, Sai said. If anyone tries to harm Zabuza-sama, then they will die, Haku said, determination clear in his voice. Do you really want to live your life as a tool to a man who doesn't really care if you live or die, unless it stops you from completing his goal? Sai asked, seeing if he could get Haku to question his loyalty. Yes. Haku replied briefly. Why? He saved my life. So? With Ino, Samui, and Amoe. Samui had killed her opponent and had moved off to help Amoe with his, as he had been having a little trouble once his opponent had revealed that he could leech chakra through mere touch. Meanwhile Ino was sneaking up on her opponent as her cage bunshine, which had been taught to her by Naruto, distracted him by attacking with a chokuto. As her cage bunshine thrust at her opponent he moved closer to Ino's hiding place by coincidence as he tried to back off. Seizing the opportunity, Ino bolted out of her hiding place and knocked him out with the handle of her kunai. Ordinarily she would have killed him, no matter how much it disgusted her, but he had made no move to attack her. It was almost as if he was asking for repentance and a second chance. Thinking this line of thought, she used her Shinten Shin no Jutsu to walk his mind and see if he truly wanted to repent. Samui and Amoi, finishing off their opponent a few minutes later after Amoi acted like he was out of chakra, saw Ino's slumped body and settled down to wait before she came back out. Not cool, said Samue. With Sai and Haku, does he mean to say that if I went to Konoha, I could have a family? I could have a different purpose? Haku's mind was racing. To tell the truth, he hated the fact that he served Zabuza so well, but it was pretty much all he knew, so he stayed, afraid of being on her own. Now it seemed that Konoha was offering him a chance to leave, she would never be alone again. Thanks, he said briefly turning to Sai and smiling. It was nothing, after all Naruto did the same for me, he said, smiling before looking towards Naruto's fight. Do you think I could be on the same team as you and Naruto? It was obvious Haku didn't really want him to leave, so Sai stayed. Yeah, after all he calls the Hokage GG so it shouldn't really be a problem, Sai said. He does what? Haku asked, scandalized. Sai just laughed. Now with all fights apart from Naruto's finished, 
Everyone gathered to watch Naruto's fight with Zabuza, after all it wasn't every day that one saw two Kenjutsu masters fight with pure Kenjutsu. Some of the Janan were about to raise questions seeing the unconscious missing Nin from Ame, Haku, and especially the unconscious Yugito, but Kanako told them to deal with it after Naruto's fight with Zabuza was finished unless they needed medical attention. As they watched Naruto and Zabuza fight they discussed it amongst themselves. Man, I ain't sure that I could beat that brat. Be wrapped as he watched the two fight. At the statement the Kumo Janan, including the recently awoken Yugito, looked slightly alarmed. B was one of the best shinobi in Kumo, if not the best. Well, he is able to beat the Sundaime Hokage in pure ninjutsu, Kanako said proudly, remembering the spar that the two held once a month. At this the jaws of all the Janan, Haku and B dropped. The Sundaime Hokage specialized in ninjutsu and buchatsu, to be able to beat him only using ninjutsu was incredible. It's more like dancing, isn't it? Haku commented as they watched Naruto flow through and around Zabuza's attacks before inflicting his own. All the spectators had to agree, as Naruto's movements, at least what they could see of them, were very graceful, full of twirls and spins. Eventually it got to the stage where Naruto had one of his ninjato pointed at Zabuza's throat and the other at his heart, Kabi Karabocha lying several meters off to one side after Naruto cut off one of Zabuza's hands. Do you surrender? Naruto said his eyes and voice giving everyone the chills. Before Zabuza could spit in his face, everyone heard clapping from the far end of the bridge. Everyone looked past the two Kenjutsu masters and saw Gato with a few hundred bandits and cutthroats behind him. Gato what is this? Zabuza roared in anger at having been betrayed by his now former employer. This was always my plan, you missing Nin cost too much. I got all of these men for the very same price, and it seems that you couldn't even do the job. Pathetic, the demon of the hidden mist. More like a weak-willed kitten. Gato sneered at the former member of the Seven Swordsmen. Zabuza turned back to Naruto, who had lowered his sword slightly. It seems that we are no longer enemies, he said briefly before walking to one side and picking up Gubi Kirabocho. He looked at Naruto, who had unsealed an Okatana from a storage seal after sheathing his ninjutos. Together? He asked him, receiving a nod in return, and with it the two of them plunged into the mass of men facing them. The remainder of the shinobi watched as the two of them working their way quickly through the men shredding whatever formation they had previously been in. Naruto used his pure speed to cut his way forward, jumping over the head of men and twirling this way and that, while Zabuza used pure strength cutting down all who opposed him in wide sweeping blows, but received a lot of damage in return. Zabuza eventually collapsed as Naruto cut down the last few men before turning to Gato, who he handed over to the recently arrived crowd of wave villagers. He then returned as Haku knelt down to his former master in order to hear his last words. Haku. I am sorry for the way I treated you, but it's too late now. Take Kabi Karabocho with you, there are Kenjutsu scrolls on it back in the hideout. Go with Konoha, they will look after you due to your bloodline, apparently there are members of your family there as well, Zabuza said, gasping in between words. Thank you for all you gave me Zabuza. I will make sure that you are not forgotten, Haku said, closing his eyes for a time in sadness. He then retrieved Kabi Karabocho from nearby and sealed it within a scroll before taking Zabuza off the bridge and over to the mainland of the Elemental Nations. Two weeks later, after that there was a huge celebration held by the villagers of Wave, which increased after Naruto and Sai brought back all the money Gato had stolen from them while accompanying Haku. Zabuza and Naruto were honored as the heroes of Wave, which got Naruto a lot of attention, which he didn't particularly want. And the word of Konoha's deathly angel's true identity was spread across the Elemental Nations. In order to escape from all the attention pretty much all of the shinobi hid in the nearby forest training, none of them seemed to like the fame very much. The missing nin from Amiga Kura that Hino had knocked out was called Kurino, and he had begged for a second chance to Kanako and asked if it was possible he could take an in by Konoha. He was very skilled in Genjutsu and had formed a natural friendship with both Ino and Kurinai, although Kiba remained slightly suspicious of him. Haku meanwhile became friends with both of the Konoha teams and most of the Kumo team as Kuro treated suspiciously. But she was best friends with Team 7 and Kurino, who had hated his time as an Ame Shinobi and as a missing nin and now that he had become friends with others, started smiling a lot more. Eventually it was time for the three teams, Haku and Kurino to leave Wave and go their separate ways. The Kumo team was to go back to Kumo until the Chunin exams, and B was grumbling incessantly about not be able to leave the city for almost two months. The Konoha Ninja, now that their final missions needed to register in the Chunin exams were complete, would be staying and training in Konoha for them. All of the Janan promised to face each other in the exams, eager to see how much their friends had grown. However the most surprising thing was when Tazuna and Tsunami asked to talk with Kakano, Naruto, and Kurinai. Okay, 
So what's this about? Kakano asked as the three shinobi stood in the empty dining room with the two adults. Well, seeing the actions of the group of shinobi that helped has made many parents wonder if their children could grow to do the same. Tsunami started uncertainly. You don't mean to say that? Kurin I started, eyes wide. Yes, many children, after seeing and hearing of the battle on the bridge, wish to become shinobi. Now even if you don't accept to take them, we shall still give a majority of our trade to Konoha, but even Inari wants to become a shinobi. So I think that if you do accept to take them, we will allow you to recruit shinobi from Wave, Tazuna stated. We will need to discuss this before we make our decision, Naruto said, interested by the idea. At this the two adults nodded and filed out of the room. Once they were gone the three shinobi began to discuss the possibility of Inari and a few other children going to Konoha with them. It would be a bonus to Konoha, as we would gain a crop of new shinobi, and even if we decline, they will still trade with us. Kanako said. And I think Hokage-sama will like the idea, although we will have to come up with a different training system for them, as many are likely going to be too old to attend the academy, Kurin I put in. So we are in agreement, we will accept, and on the way back to Konoha we shall think of a training program to put them through to make up for the academy, Naruto concluded, interested at training from a teacher's perspective. Although it does depend on how many are wanting to go to Konoha, Kanako added, resting her head in her hands. Tezna. Naruto called out through the door. Yes, just how many children are interested? Naruto asked smiling. I think around 12 pairs of parents are thinking of the idea, so that would be around 15 kids as several of them have two kids, Tazuna said, rapidly estimating in his head. Perfect. Well we have agreed to take those 15 back to Konoha with us, although they better be prepared to leave soon, as we are leaving in two days, so can you go round and notify the parents of this decision? Naruto asked kindly. Tazuna nodded an affirmative before hurrying out of the house to try and find the children's parents. As such the two Konoha teams found themselves leaving Wave two days later accompanied by 15 children, many of whom had immediately started addressing the Konoha Janan as their older brothers of sisters. The Kumo team had left the day before, so everyone was slightly late to the meeting point as Wave had decided to have a massive celebration last night, and everyone was really tired. All the parents were anxiously saying goodbye to their children all of whom were really excited at the thought of becoming shinobi, and Kanako was carrying a document for the Hokage containing a trade agreement between Wave and Konoha. Two days later all the Janan had become rather annoyed by the loud shouts and talking of the children, to the point that that night, Naruto got fed up and started training their fitness, consequently exhausting the children. Due to them being tired it would take an extra half day to reach the Konoha gates, and Kanako beat Naruto over the head when she realized this fact. Around 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the next day they finally arrived at Konoha's massive gates, and all of the children were subdued by awe. Everything's so big. Inari thought as he looked at the buildings inside Konoha's gates as Kanako and Kurunai signed them in. So what's with all the kids? Izumo asked as he looked at the children. Apparently all of them want to become shinobi, Kanako sighed tiredly before motioning for everyone to follow her inside. Kur and I dismissed Team 8, telling them they had a few days off before they would be expected for training once more. As such it was a group of 22 that trooped off to the Hokage's tower, Team 7 looking out for the children concernedly, making sure none strayed off. Hokage's office. Hiru's inside in consternation, Team 7 and 8 were a day late from their mission, and although with the Jown and Sensei's present along with Naruto and Sai could look after themselves and keep their team safe, he couldn't help but worry. He was broken from his thoughts when seals that Naruto had put into his desk indicated him that there were people approaching his office. Hey Gigi, Naruto said, opening the door, and letting in what seemed to be a mass of people. Hiruzen stared quietly at the children and the two unknown missing nins before sighing quietly. Naruto, perhaps you would be so kind as to tell me why this people are here? His tone indicated that he was going to have to talk with Naruto afterwards. Naruto gulped, well, these two are missing nin that wish to join Konoha, Naruto said indicating Kurino and Haku. And why would they want to do that? Hiruzen asked, interrupting Naruto. Well Haku is a member of the Yuki clan, and his family in Konoha. He was also never an actual shinobi so the hunter nin aren't after him. Meanwhile Kurino was a missing nin from Amigakura that escaped while Hanzo was fighting the civil war, which has apparently ended, Kanako said, seeing that Hiruzen was making Naruto flounder. And what can they contribute? Hiruzen said in a clipped tone. He should have known Naruto would manage to be embroiled in something like this. Hokage-sama, I have several scrolls on Kenjutsu and Water Jutsu from my former master Momochi Zabuza, Haku said, stepping forward slightly. And I have a good knowledge of Genjutsu and assassination techniques used by Alme Shinobi, Kurino said in a quiet tone. Hiruzen had to admit, 
those were both very useful things. Alright you two can join, and as neither of you are evaluated on your rank, you'll be attaches to team 7 as they are who you are most comfortable with, here who's inside. The two stepped back. Now I hope one of you has an answer as to why there are around 15 children in my office? Hiruzen glared at Naruto before Kaneko coughed quietly. Actually Hokage-sama, there is something here for you to read, she said as she pulled out the missive from Tazna. Hiruzen looked over it before saying, Well, we shall send a Chunin saying that we agree, but have any of you come up with any ideas of how we shall train them? Hiruzen said in a slightly kinder tone as he regarded the children. Actually Gigi, I have a suggestion. Perhaps we could do the same that we did with me and Sai, just on a lower level. Perhaps you could let some of the Jinan join in as a learning experience before they become Jounin and Senseis, Naruto put in from one side. Actually that isn't a bad idea, but first we shall need to find a place for them to live, Hiruzen said. They could live in my apartment building, along with Kurino, as not many live there due to my status, and it is well protected due to my seals, said Naruto as he got along well with the apartment owner and had put seals all over the place to prevent it from being damaged or burnt down. So we are in agreement, they shall live in Kosuke's apartment building for the time being, depending on whether they want to move out, Hiruzen said, nodding. Now all apart from Sai, Kanako and Naruto are dismissed. Ino and Kurinai, could you take Hako to her compound and introduce her to her family, and also take Kurino and the children to Kosuke's, just tell him that I sent you, he'll understand. Hiruzen said before turning his attention to the three in front of him. Kanako, can you hand over your report on the mission, Hiruzen, which he summarily put on top of the huge stack of papers that his cage Bunshine were working on. Alright, as we all know the Chunin exams are being held within Konoha in around a month and a half's time. This will be a prime opportunity for agents to infiltrate Konoha, so we need to prepare for extra security and perhaps even an invasion. This is primarily a task for you three as your Fuu and Jutsu and Ink Jutsu will allow us to keep track of security and warn us if an invasion is likely. So I need you three to come up with a way to monitor the village. Also I need you Kanako and Naruto to go over the seals on Konoha's walls and if possible, upgrade them. Sai, while they are doing that, you will be monitoring the incoming competitors to check if something is off, is this understood? Hiruzen briefed them. Hi, Hokage-sama, the three replied. Oh, Gigi. It might be time to reveal the identity of Konoha's deathly angel, Naruto suggested. Hiruzen looked at him, curious as to his reasoning, before Naruto motioned to Kanako's report. Dismissed, Hiruzen said vaguely as he began reading of their most recent mission. Naruto and Sai sighed tiredly as they waited for Ino to meet them at the bridge. Over the past four weeks they had been working to the bone preparing for the Chunin exams while also completing their mission for the Hokage. There was now only two weeks until the exams and they had finally figured out the solution to their mission after Naruto had invented something called a relay seal. These seals were connected to seals all around Konoha, transmitting information on people, location, time, and key to pick up mentions of invasions and the like. All this information would then transmit itself to the Hokage every half hour. This was compounded by Sai using the same seal on his ink creatures, allowing them to mobile information gatherers on the competing teams. Another reason for their tiredness was the children they had picked up in Wave, they literally drove Naruto insane, demanding for training at all hours, and eventually they had to create cage bunshines to start their training. And between all of this they had been helping Ino continue to get ready for the exams, not that she really needed it, but she wanted to impress. Hey guys, sorry I'm late. Ino called as she rushed over, having run to the meeting point to help keep up her fitness. Ino had changed a lot from the fangirl that she had been in the academy. She now wore black pants and red shirt. Although this was framed by a black ankle-length trench coat with a red angel on the back. Her chokudo was at her hip, confident that she could use it efficiently having been taught in Kenjutsu by Naruto. She had her headband hanging loosely around her neck. It's alright, after all Nei-chan hasn't arrived yet, so you aren't really late, Sai said smiling. Ordinarily Haku and Kurino would be there with the three of them, but as Kanako said it was just the three of them that needed to be here. They were watching over the children from Wave, who had a habit of getting in trouble. Typically because Konohamaru managed to involve them in his pranks. Naruto had introduced Konohamaru to Haku, Kurino and Ino about half a week after they had returned, and it was rather explosive when he thought that Haku was a girl. Hey guys, Kanako said after shun shining to the end of the bridge. Hey Nei-chan, all three of them replied as Ino had begun to see her friends as her second family. Alright, we aren't doing training today, as you have the day off to think about and sign these, Kanako said, handing out three forms for the Chunin exams. All three took one glance at them before saying something, not looking up, 
Anyone have a brush? Kanako sighed. I should have known it was worthless asking these three, they were going to say yes all along. Fifteen minutes later the three walked out of the Hokaye's office, having just handed in their forms for the Chunin exams. They weren't surprised to encounter teammate on the way out, as they knew that they would be attending. As such they waited for teammate before they all decided that they would go see how team 10 was doing and from there they would split. Team 7 were going to go bug team 9 having spent a few training sessions together, while team 8 was going to go spend time with the children from Wave. As such they all dawdled their way to training ground 10 in order to meet team 10 and see how they were doing. Naruto grumbled when they initially set out, not wanting to have to put up with Asuma, who always disliked him due to his casual friendliness with most of the Kunoichi around town, but came along anyway. As the 6 Shinan walked through the training ground 10 boundaries, they became aware of high-pitched shrieking ahead of them. Everyone winced in pity for Choji and Shikamaru, they must have suffered broken eardrums being in the presence of that. After the shrieking stopped Kiba said something that everyone agreed with, poor bastards. Naruto quickly created several sets of earplugs using his Uzumaki bloodline before handing them out to everyone, and everyone proceeded to stuff them in their ears in order to preserve their eardrums. Now thoroughly prepared, everyone walked towards the sound, eventually coming to the sight of Shikamaru and Choji Cloud watching while Sakura daydreamed from a nearby tree. Naruto mentally thanked Kami that Asuma seemed to be absent. Hey guys, Kiba called, taking the earplugs out of his ears and waving to the team. Oh, hey, Shikamaru said lazily after lifting his head to see who it was. So, you guys ready for the Chunin exams? Kiba asked. Well, I am thinking of entering, Choji said while munching on a bag of chips. Naruto Baka, where is Sasuke-kun? Sakura screeched while examining the two teams, thinking that Sasuke might be hidden away somewhere. Ah, uh, he's been in hospital for the past five months, Naruto was actually quite surprised that she didn't know. What? What did you do to him Naruto Baka? Sakura screeched, if it was possible even louder. First day of training after our Jinan exams, he called my mother a whore, so I punched through three trees. Apparently he had around 78 broken bones, and will remain in the hospital for around another year. Naruto said in a conversational tone, shocking team 10, what? Sakura screeched in disbelief before hurrying off to the hospital. And as Naruto walked off to one side, Shikamaru turned to Ino. Three trees? He asked incredulously. Yep. One punch, she said almost proudly. Well I see that someone's not a fangirl any longer, Shikamaru commented, taking in her appearance. The Jinan exams at the academy gave me a wake-up call. Ino said shortly before she began to talk to the two of other things. After their conversation with Team 10, in which Naruto learned that Asuma was actually a very lazy sensei, the two teams split up, with Team 7 making the short journey to training ground 9. Ino knew what to expect as she had met Guy during her initial training before Wave, but she still hated the eternal sunset genjutsu that Lee and Guy managed to produce, like so many others. And even though Naruto and Sai had spent their time ever since Guy had gained the team last year trying to break Kyuga Neji out of his icy attitude, neither had managed to, as Neji would not divulge the cause of it. However all three had agreed that at the moment Tenten was the most likable of the three making up Team 9, although all admired the training and dedication shown by Lee, he did drive them crazy with his talk of flames of youth. Hey guys, and Tenten, and Neji. Naruto called, wondering how Neji would react when he greeted by his name, when before he just counted him in with the guys. And what is your exclusion of me from guys meant to indicate, Naruto-san? Neji said in his uptight manner, just that you're no longer included in that category by my standards, at least Neji treated him and Sai courteously, as both had beaten him whenever they sparred, but he didn't extend the same to Ino. Neji didn't react to the direct insult and turned back to watching Lee and Guy do their insane physical exercises. Ino spent her time talking with Tenten as the two watched Neji and Naruto spar along with Lee and Guy. Both Neji and Naruto, along with occasionally Sai, had to put up with Lee constantly challenging them, as they were his eternal rivals. All three of them had silently agreed that they would take turns dealing with Lee's challenges to make them less of a bother. And although all three internally found Lee's determination impressive, it annoyed the hell out of them, especially when they were having a bad day. And Naruto drew the majority of the challenges, being a former student of Guy himself, eventually surpassing him due to his sheer speed. As Naruto and Neji sparred, all knew that it was Naruto who was going to win, as Neji's styles were purely Hyuga techniques, and all Taijutsu based meaning that Naruto could just throw jutsu after jutsu at Neji until he got exhausted. However, Naruto liked to test Neji, and faced him in taijutsu, decreasing his chakra weights whenever Neji scored a hit on one of his tenkutsu. Eventually it got to the point where he got so fast that even Guy could barely even see him, and Neji gave the victory over to Naruto after getting punched through a tree. Yosh, 
Naruto-san's flames burn as brightly as ever. Lee exclaimed loudly, I think it is time that we go, Nisan, Naruto said to Guy, knowing that if he didn't, Lee would challenge him to a fight. The three from Team 7 quickly made their way out of the training ground. Well I shall see you guys tomorrow, Naruto said as he turned to go over to Gigi's office, while Sayandino went over to training ground 4 where Team 8 along with Haku and Kurino were currently training the children that had come with them from Wave. Ino turned to Sai, how about a race to see who can get to the training ground first? Ino wasn't afraid to ask Sai to a race as her training had increased her speed to low down in levels when she took off her chakra weights. Well if you aren't afraid to lose, Sai grinned before both of them released what chakra weights they had and took off, leaving massive dust clouds behind them. With Team 8, Haku and Kurino. Team 8 and Kurino had unanimously decided that Haku was the best out of the five of them to instruct the 15 children in the basics of being shinobi. As such the four of them were watching Haku tell the children to do push-ups and sit-ups in order to increase their stamina and strength. Well, we are in agreement that Haku is a sadistic bastard when it comes to training, Kiba stated as they had noticed that Haku seemed to take pleasure in watching others suffer through the joys of training. However everyone's attention was grabbed when they saw a massive dust cloud billowing towards the gate. Hinata activated her Byakugan to see Ino and Sai racing their way towards the gate, with Sai narrowly winning. What the hell was that? Kiba asked as everyone gazed in the direction of the training ground gate. That was just Ino and Sai having a little race, Hinata said. This immediately caught the attention of all the children who raced off to greet their Nechan and Nichan, Inari sprinting out in front. Well at least I won't be the only one teaching them anymore, you lazy bastards, Haku sighed. Haku himself had undergone a massive change in character ever since he came to Konoha. His appearance was pretty much the same, as apparently he had fun cross-dressing and screwing with people's heads, but around his friends his character was much more relaxed. Kurino was the same, minus the cross-dressing, but was still very wary of people he didn't know, although he seemed to relax around the children. Okay, now that the two of us are here, you will split up into three groups of five, they heard Sai telling the children calmly after he and Ino greeted them. The children did so relatively quickly, with there being only a few arguments about friends and so on. Alright, the three groups will work on a rotational basis, one group will work on ninjutsu basics, while another works on genjutsu basics and the last on taijutsu basics. You will have half an hour with each before you swap to the next discipline. You will be group 1, you lot group 2 and you guys group 3, Sai said quickly explaining their training outline. The Janan quickly split themselves into different groups with Kiba, Sai and Hinata doing Taijutsu, Kurino and Shino doing Genjutsu, and leaving Ino and Haku to do Ninjutsu. Both the Ninjutsu and the Genjutsu group were merely working on activating the children's chakra networks, before the Ninjutsu group would begin work on the basic academy Jutsu and the Genjutsu group would begin with basic chakra control. The Taijutsu group would be working their way through the basic academy style before doing a small sparring contest to see how well they picked it up. Meanwhile with Naruto. Naruto had just been allowed into the Hokage's office after the secretary had run out of reasons to keep him out. So how are you liking it Jigi? Naruto asked smugly as he saw the Hokage looking at what looked to be a spare table in a far corner of the room while his cage Bunshine were working their way through the piles of papers on his desk. This is amazing Naruto. It's like have sensor ninja all over the city constantly transmitting. One could clearly hear the glee in Hiruzen's voice. What the Hokage was actually looking at was Naruto pride and joy as a sealing master. It was the receiver for all the information that his sensor seals gathered and transmitted. It was a 3D model encompassing all of Konoha showing the location of every single person in the city, and if they were a ninja, the seals could even catch samples of their unique chakra patterns, allowing someone to track a person through the city and hear all they say etc. All the Hokage had to do was touch his finger to a chakra signature, send a burst of chakra, and the receiver would come up with a list of recent information. In essence it was the ultimate security measure in terms of dealing with spies and capturing criminals. Along with the fact that every Anbu captain had received upgraded headpieces to use in the case of an invasion, as they were linked to a microphone on the receiver. Also Gigi, Nechan and I went over the seals on Konoha's walls and we upgraded several meaning they could stand over 100 of Tsunade's punches combined at any one time. We even managed to reiki the seals for Konoha's alarm field to be able to change it into a solid barrier of chakra that will be able to stop a tailed beast bomb from the Nibi no Nekamata, Naruto said proudly, as he had invented a bunch of completely new seals for it to work. Really? Hiruzen asked curiously, in the case of an invasion that would help greatly. Yep, well remind Kanako and Sai to come see me with you when you want to receive your payment, Hiruzen said, smiling before turning back to the receiver as Naruto left. As Naruto was walking through Konoha to Ijiraku's ramen he heard the sound of a commotion and a rather familiar voice. Put me down. Shut the hell up rat. 
That fucking hurt, so I am going to teach you a lesson. Naruto immediately recognized both voices, the younger one was that of Konohamaru, the Sandy Ames grandson, while the older one was that of Sabaku no Konkuro, middle child of the Yondame Kaze Kage and specializing in the use of puppets. Naruto raced round the corner to see Konohamaru being held at shoulder height of the ground by Konkuro, who was accompanied by a blonde girl with her hair in four buns, obviously his older sister Sabaku no Tamari. Naruto briefly wondered where their younger sister was before dismissing the thoughts as he saw Konkuro draw back his fist in order to punch Konohamaru. Konkuro was about to pummel this brat, he ran into him and has the nerve to demand that he be let go. Put me down. The brat he was holding off the ground shouted at him. That's it, he's pissed me off. Shut the hell up brat. That fucking hurt, so I am going to teach you a lesson. Konkuro shouted at the boy, before pulling his fist back to punch him. His fist launched, he was certain of that. But it never reached Konohamaru, as Naruto had intercepted the punch calmly, as if it was little more than a feather. Tamari gasped when she saw the rather handsome boy intercept Konkuro's punch like it was nothing. She hadn't even seen him move, one moment he wasn't there, the next he was. Naruto calmly stopped Konkuro's fist before grabbing his wrist and forcing him to drop Konohamaru, who he then caught before he landed on the ground. Go over to your friends Kano, Naruto said in a voice of quiet anger as he nudged the young boy back. Yes Nisan. Konohamaru said confidently now that Naruto was here. Who subsequently turned back to face the two sooner Janan. You fool, you could have started a war. Did you even know that that was the son Daime Hokaye's grandson you just tried to hit? Konkuro paled slightly at the knowledge, but backed off slightly before beginning to pull the huge package off his back. Konkuro, you're going to bring Crow out here? Tamari asked furiously. This asshole deserves it for insulting me, Konkuro said angrily. I really wouldn't try doing that. Naruto warned, creating his wings with his chakra. As soon as Tamari saw the wings she gasped, Konkuro, stop. That's Konoha's deathly angel. The youngest bingo booker in history and the youngest S-ranked nin, Tamari said hurriedly, stopping Konkuro in his actions, after all, and S-ranked shinobi is not a fight very many chose. Well not to mention my teammates behind you with a tanto and a chokudo to each of your necks, Naruto said in an amused tone before turning and telling whoever was in the tree to come out and stop hiding. At this both of the Sunajanan looked at each other anxiously, Gaia had never taken to following orders kindly unless she liked the orders. That and the possibility that she had seen the incident involving Konkuro and Konohamaru. Gaia looked down upon the scene from the branches that she was hanging from, having returned from checking in with the Konoha registration office to confirm that they had actually arrived, even if it was two weeks early for the exams. She had seen the entire incident between Konkuro and the brat. Honestly, Konkuro is such a whiner, the brat barely bumped him, she thought, her lips twitching up in a smile, before recomposing her face into the angry glare that she usually had it in. Ooh, someone powerful has arrived, Gaia, you will have to feed me his blood, Shukaku muttered crazily in the back of her mind. In return for Gaia being such a good source of blood and death, Shukaku had begun to call her by her real name recently. Hearing Naruto call for her to come out. Gaia used a sand sunshine and appeared in front of her two older siblings. And you are? Naruto asked knowing full well who this was. Gaia's one visible pale green glared at him from behind chin length spiky dark red hair that flared across her face, obscuring the majority of her face. Sabaku no Gaia, she introduced briefly before turning and repatriating Konkuro. So this is soon as Jinchuriki, Naruto thought upon seeing her. It was obvious that she had been turned into a weapon by her village, but perhaps it had failed. As Naruto thought he saw a flicker of humanity in her eyes she turned back to face him. And you are? Gaia asked of Team 7, Ino and Sai having sunshine behind Naruto, and sheathed their blades. Team 7 of Kanahaga Kour. This is Sai, Yamanaka Ino, and my name is Uzumaki Naruto, Naruto said, introducing his team. It will be interesting to face your team in the Chunin exams Uzumaki, Gaia said with a glint of hunger in her visible eye. Oh man, Suna really did a number on her. Naruto thought exasperatedly in disgust. Naruto and his team watched silently as the three San siblings began to walk back the way they had come. Oh, Gaia, if you want me to fix your seal, you need only ask, Naruto called. He saw Gaia pause and glare at him over her shoulder before she continued walking. After the encounter with the San siblings Naruto accompanied Konohamaru for a small game of ninja, before going off and doing some private training until he decided to turn in for the night.
his fight with Zabuzo had shown him that it was always a good idea to have a few things to pull you out of tight spots, whether it was a reliable defense jutsu or advantages on skills that you kept hidden. The day of the beginning of the Chunin exams, Team 7 had all agreed that they would meet at the bridge outside of Training Ground 7 as they usually did before walking to the first area of the Chunin exams, which, funnily enough, was the Ninja Academy. They had all been told to go to Room 305, which made both Naruto and Dino groan at bad jokes that room having been the room that they used for taijutsu basics while attending the academy. Sai never got the joke, having never attended the academy in the first place, although officially one needed to attend in order to be a Konoha shinobi. As they walked through Konoha's streets, they discussed their meeting with their friends from Kumo, who had arrived a week ago, and Sai's information on the various participants from the other shinobi villages. Flashback no jutsu. Naruto. Naruto turned as he heard the shouting of rather familiar voices, to see B. Yugito, Samui and Amoe coming towards him from down the street. Hmm, did you guys say something? Naruto said casually as he pulled a book out and began to read it. All four of the Kumo Shinobi face faulted. Yo, Naruto, ain't you happy to see us? B rapped badly while he recovered from his face fault. What? Oh it's you guys, when did you get here? Naruto said, acting innocent. And so the five of them talked about things that they had been doing including sadistic senseis. Hokage-sama made me organize security for the city. Let's just say, I'm not known as the foremost fu and jutsu expert in the elemental nations for nothing. You guys won't be able to move a muscle without us knowing, Naruto said smugly. Now that sounds intriguing, can you tell us more Naruto-kun? Yugito asked, knowing what the answer would be, but still wanted to tease him. Where is Karu? Naruto asked, changing the subject, and for good reason, as Karu isn't with them. Amoe sighed. Kara didn't want to attend the exams, after sparring against your team she felt as if she needed to do more work and try and go for Chunin next year, Amoe explained, around the sucker he had just put in his mouth. Naruto just nodded in acceptance before the five of them moved off to find the rest of team 7 and 8. Flashback no jutsu end. Naruto sighed, Kuro should have attended, it wasn't her skills keeping her back, just her hot-headed nature, and he was sure that Kiba was going to be disappointed about not being able to spar her having been beaten by her in wave. Team 7 quickly arrived at the academy with over half an hour of time left to spare before they needed to be here. The three of them walked straight past the genjutsu that two chunins Izumo and Kotetsu put up on the door label of room 205, and were the first team to be waiting in 305. Unfortunately they had been the interest of Team 9 when they arrived, and Lee, seeing them walk up another floor, finally realized it was a genjutsu, and shouted it rather loudly before rushing up after them so they were only really about 15 minutes ahead of everyone else. With everyone breaking into their teams or hanging out with their friends, Naruto just stayed with his team and teams 8 and 10, although he did pay a brief visit to the Kumo team. At the moment however he was beginning to get annoyed, Sakura, you stupid Naruto Baka. How could you put the great Sasuke-kun in hospital? She wailed, right in his ear. At this many of the gathered shinobi looked round at Naruto wondering what he had to do with the last Ichiha not being present. Quiet down, don't you people understand that people are very tense at the moment, an older Konoha Jinan said, coming over to the group of rookies. You know, considering that you guys are rookies, I'll lend you guys a hand. I have information on every competitor here, there's even a rumor going around that Konoha's deathly angel is in these exams. If you can guess who it is then I shall tell you everything I can on him, the Jinan said, pausing all talk in the hall at the information. And you are? Sayest stepping forward slightly, even though he already knew. Ah, uh, I haven't introduced myself have I? I am Yakushi Kabuto and seventh time veteran of the Chunin exams, Kabuto said, causing a snigger from Kiba. The two of them got into a brief argument, which was interrupted when Sai asked about the information Kabuto had mentioned earlier. So who is it you want to get info on? Kabuto asked, pulling out his info cards. Samui and Yugito of Kumo, along with Sabaku no Gaia, Sai requested. Ah, uh, you know their names. That doesn't make it any fun, Kabuto said with a bit of sarcasm in his voice. Let's see, Sabaku no Gaia, no D ranks to speak of, but has completed 15 C ranks and 2 B ranks, impressive. Her control over the sub-element of sand is legendary from reports of those who witnessed her fight and escaped. It is also important to note that she has never suffered from any sort of injury in her entire life, not even a scratch, Kabuto read, shocking everyone but the sand siblings and Team 7, whose own info said much the same thing. As for Yugito and Samui of Kumo, the two are on the same Janan team and were trained by the Reikage's brother. Yugito has a great control of her fire affinity, 
almost to the point where her mastery is unprecedented accepting fire affinity experts such as Achiha Madara. Samui has an affinity for both lightning and water elements and both are reasonably good in Kenjutsu along with their teammate, Kabuto read of his card, annoyed he didn't have their mission record. Well I have a person I would like for you to give me information on, all turned, rather surprised, to see Gaia, who proceeded to point wordlessly at Naruto, who rolled his eyes casually before motioning for Kabuto to go ahead. They wouldn't be able to do anything about it anyway. Everyone could see the grin on Kabuto's face. Uzumaki Naruto, full name classified at the highest level, and commonly referred to as Angel while on missions due to being the possessor of the title of the youngest Bingo Booker in history. He is also cage level in Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, Kenjutsu, and Fuuinjutsu, with his only weak point being Genjutsu, although that is around on the level. Known to the elemental nations as Konoha's Deathly Angel, he is usually accompanied on missions by Hitake Kanako, or Kanako of the Sharingan and Konoha's panther, his teammate Sai. He left a blood clone at the academy while undergoing private training from around seven elite Anbu and undertook many missions while officially only an academy student and a civilian. His mission record rivals that of Hitake Kanako in S-ranked missions and has been recorded to have beaten the current Hokage while limiting himself to only ninjutsu. In short he is one of the most dangerous individuals currently alive and the only one of those at the age of 12. Full mission record. 15 D ranks. 223C ranks, 63B ranks, 32A ranks and 14S rank missions. He is known as Konoha's angel due to the fact while fighting he can subconsciously channel chakra to his back and create solid wings. These wings can also interact as part of an ultimate defense and even allow him to fly. He is recorded to have three bloodlines, although he only uses one due to the other two being classified. The one he uses is his Uzumaki chakra which allows him to create temporary solid objects due to the quality level of his chakra, which even for no Nuzumaki is off the records. It is rumored that it is highly likely that at the end of the Chunin exams his heritage and full ancestry, along with his bloodlines, will be revealed, which have remained classified thus far due to the possibility of causing the fourth shinobi war, Kabuto said, awing everyone, excepting Naruto and Sai. I didn't think that he was that capable even after looking up his status in the bingo book, Yugi Ito thought as she stared at Naruto awestruck. Naruto was silent as the room silently stared at him, before he finally started to get annoyed by it. What the hell are you staring at? He shouted, subconsciously flaring his chakra into his wings. There he goes, just like Kabuto-san said he could, Guy thought as Shukaku's mutterings grew louder in the back of her mind. All right maggots, that's enough. The newly arrived proctor shouted, his Chunin assistants behind him. Naruto had spent the majority of the first exam talking with Kachan and Kyara chan in his mindscape while he was waiting for time to pass, although he did answer the questions so that Ino could use her Shinten Shin no Jutsu on him. Sai wouldn't need any help, being trained the same way Naruto was originally, but it had been very interesting to see how various people were cheating their way through, as was the point of course. Gaia had used a sand eyeball, which Naruto had to say was pretty creepy. The Hyugas used their Byakugan that being the obvious solution as they could see through people and just copy their answers. Kiba and Shino had used their various companions, although Akamaru was a little obvious. Shikamaru had used a good strategy, writing down his answers, being a genius, while also writing Choji's using his shadow possession technique. Sakura just knew the answers. The Kumo Shinobi had been tapping their answers out slowly to each other in Morse code. But Naruto thought that Konkuro's strategy was the worst as it was pretty obvious and it only had one chance of success, if it failed, then the sand siblings were screwed, as they had to pass the first two exams as their teams. Naruto shuddered to think of how Gaia would react to them failing in the first exam, she might even kill her siblings. Alright. It is now time for the tenth and final question. So you will need to listen to the rules that are attached to this question. 1. If you fail this question that you will never be allowed to enter the tuning exams ever again. In other words, you will remain a Janan for the rest of your lives. At this cries of denial and tumult rose up. And how will you stop us? We can just go to another exam next year, at which time the proctor will have changed due to it being in a different village, Kiba cried rather logically. I don't care, my exam, my rules, Iviki said, shrugging. Naruto was mentally giggling at the game Iviki was playing. The two had worked alongside each other on several occasions, both being able to break down the minds of those they were interrogating although Naruto worked best if it was a traitor to the village. However, we are generous, we will give you a chance to leave before the tenth question is given. If you choose to do so, then your teammates fail as well but you will be able to take the tuning exams next year. You have 15 minutes to make your decision. 
Iviki said before moving off the stage. Over the next 15 minutes hand rose and fell as people gave into the metal strain, taking their teammates down with them. Towards the end however, Hinata cracked and began to raise her hand up. Naruto immediately held it back down before whispering fiercely, Are you going to give up on that promise and be the cause of teammate not being there when we spar our friends? Hinata immediately felt ashamed inside, but also gained a sense of conviction, she was going through this for her team. Iviki, seeing that no one else was going to raise their hand, moved forward to the lectern. Congratulations, you who remain have just passed the first exam. Iviki waited for the uproar, and he wasn't disappointed. What? Naruto burst out laughing. Their reaction was hilarious. Although after he quieted down he was roped into explaining the meaning of the first exam because apparently he was a know-it-all. And the final question was to test our resolve, after all, if we can't hold our resolve in here how are we supposed to hold it out there? Did I get that all right, Iviki? He finished. Yeah, you got it all kiddo, now your next proctor will be someone very familiar to you, Iviki finished with a slight grin. Huh? was all Naruto managed to say before the window next to Iviki was shattered by a flying giant black blur. Fifteen seconds later, Naruto smashed his head onto the desk, he should have known they would choose her, of all people. Several rows behind him Sai was having the exact same thoughts. Naruto then smiled, he had just thought of a way to psych some of the competitors out. Nei-chan. He shouted, jumping up and running towards the second exam proctor, Anko. Naru-chan. Anko shouted back excitedly before they had a massive hug. As they hugged one another, everyone apart from Ino, Iviki and Sai thought. These two know each other question mark slash Naruto knows this woman, are we going to the forest? Naruto asked rather excitedly, he loves training ground 44. Ino and Sai came up and greeted Anko, who hugged them both as well, while everyone apart from Iviki just sat and stared at the four of them. Alright, I am the proctor of the second exam, now you need to be at training ground 44 within half an hour or you fail. Anko said, turning to the rest of the participants before turning back and shunshining to the area with Team 7. Gaia was annoyed, she had just wasted her time getting to training ground 44 due to the misdirection that apparently some people had been ordered to give. That and the thought of Naruto had been weighing on her brain constantly since she had met the boy. For some reason he seems a little familiar, and why would he offer to fix my seal for me? He must know what I am? She thought as she strode towards the second part of the tuning exams. Naruto. Sai and Ino moved through the forest of death quickly, tree hopping in order to avoid the predators that stalked the forest floor. They were following a team from Takigakura using Naruto's sensory abilities, and due to them having several sessions with Anko in this very forest for training, they stopped briefly before deciding to move ahead of them and lay an ambush. They were able to cover virtually every aspect of the shinobi arts within their team, and as such that meant if they chose the battleground it was suicide for the other team to try and defeat them. As they set up their traps, Ino made sure to make a few obvious ones so they wouldn't see the more hidden and more lethal ones underneath. Naruto was shivering with glee as he drew seals for kunai launchers on nearly every tree in a radius of 50 meters before loading them with a mass amount of kunai. The secret behind these launcher seals though, was that they were manually controlled by the sealer, in this case Naruto, allowing him to adapt his firing times and number of kunai for the circumstances. It was a death trap. The Taki team, thankfully for them maintained their current course and walked right into their ambush. The first signs they had of their current situation was when they caught sight of the obvious traps slayed by Ino, unfortunately for them. By that time they were in the middle of the larger death trap created by Naruto. Naruto had actually put ninja wire on a few of his kunai and created a ring of ninja wire around them silently so they couldn't escape easily in case they had some sort of automatic defense. At his command, a massive kunai rained down upon the trap team from all directions. They didn't have the time to react and each member of the team was riddled with at least 25 kunai. Then Naruto and the others rummaged through the remains of the shinobi, hoping that the scroll they were looking hadn't been shredded by the hail of sharp weaponry. It hadn't, and it happened to be an earth scroll, which was what they were looking for. After a meager celebration consisting of Ino cheering quietly and Naruto and Sai humming happy tunes under their breaths, they held a vote on whether they should head straight to the tower or see if they could help out the other Kanaharukis. Ino was all for heading to the tower but didn't really mind either way and Sai and Naruto agreed that the Kumo team and the San siblings were the greatest threat to them. As such they would constantly monitor both teams using Sai's ink creatures and Naruto's cage bunshine, while they rested at HQ. As such Sai immediately sent out a variety of birds and small creatures that could climb, such as monkeys to monitor the Kumo team, and Naruto sent a pair of cage bunshine to do the same for the San team. Meanwhile they would look for an ideal place for their camp. After an hour and a half of looking, they found an area that was separated from the rest of the area by fallen logs and had a natural rock overhang. 
along with a bunch of hungry predators that made their habitat just outside the main entrance, it was extremely unlikely that another team would attack them. After setting up their basic needs in the camp they decided that they would relax until their friends needed them or until night came. Naruto sent out clones to trail the two other rookie teams, as they didn't include Team 9, knowing they could handle themselves, as a precaution as they didn't know the status of the other teams. Late that evening, just after dusk, Naruto was glad that he had, as according to his clone, Team 10 was having a bit of trouble with Akuza team. Grabbing the other two, who had stayed ready, he shunshined them to the immediate area, resulting in them having to duck under an offensive jutsu that they had been right in the path of. They immediately split up before catching the Kuza team in a pincer movement, with Ino and Sai quickly taking out the two Janan to either side before Naruto flipped over a fire jutsu and beheaded the Janan. All of this happened while Team 10 was looking on in shock, and Naruto hurriedly walked over to them. Sakura, this is why fangirls have such a high mortality rate, they don't train properly and are therefore unable to fill their roles on the battlefield, costing lives, Naruto said, fixing her with a steady gaze. Sakura didn't respond just looked at the ground before beginning to tear up. Shikamaru extended his thanks, but Naruto told him that it was what Konoha Shinobi did, look out for each other. Thankfully that was the only time they had to retrieve either of the two teams, as Team 10 had managed to get their scroll from that encounter while Team 8 were able to use their Keke Genkai to avoid the more powerful teams. As such they were able to go to the tower and relax, although once they got there Naruto disappeared for a short amount of time to inform the Hokage of his suspicions concerning one Yakushi Kabuto. The shinobi gathered here are those who have passed the second round of the Chunin exams, now the Hokage would like to make a speech concerning the meaning behind the exams themselves, Onko said in a rather bored tone which a person could also see clearly on her face. As the Hokage began his speech, Naruto's attention shifted onto different things, as was usually the case when he realized the Hokage was about to make a long speech. Why does this always happen to me when I hear the old man beginning to talk? Naruto thought drearily, as he soaked up some information from the speech passively, something about being a replacement for war. Although Naruto refocused his attention once he realized that the old man was done in Gekko Hayate, one of the former Anbu that had trained him was moving forward. All right, due to the number of people that pass the second exam, we shall be having a preliminary round, so that only a small proportion go to the finals, the cream of the crop. Hayate coughed his way through the sentence. Why can't we all go to the finals? Kiba asked, because if you all went to the finals, they would take about three days to complete, and some of the matches would be very boring. The finals are to attract sponsors, while the previous two tests have tested your mentality and teamwork neither of which show how one can fare on their own against an opponent just as strong as them. In essence, the preliminaries are to stop you from embarrassing yourself in front of a huge crowd, the Hokage couldn't help but put in. Thank you Hokage-sama, now the preliminaries will be randomized, although due to his nature, Uzumaki Naruto will not be fighting Hayate started. What? But I am getting so bored here, Naruto screamed out. Hayate, I think it will be okay if Naruto spars someone, otherwise he is going to annoy the hell out of everyone else. And we both know what tends to be the result of that, Hiruzen said, remembering the last time something like this happened. Naruto had gotten so annoyed and bored that he tripled the Hokage's paperwork through a devastating pranking spree. He shuddered at the memory. Well in that case, Uzumaki-san will be allowed to fight. Now as before you will be given a chance to drop out before the preliminaries, but this time your decision will not affect your teammates. However you will need to provide a valid reason as to why you are dropping out. So. Is there anyone who wants to drop out? Hayate continued. A few of the shinobi from Taki, Kuza, Kumo and Kiri dropped out, having sustained serious injuries while in the forest of death. However everyone was mildly surprised when Kabuto elected to drop out, claiming he had chakra exhaustion. Orochimaru, disguised as a Kuza Jounin, looked down at the exam competitors. He knew that Hiruzen knew he was here, but thanks to the correspondence that Itachi and Naruto shared, he didn't have to worry about being attacked. As he watched on he was briefly annoyed once more that Sasuke wasn't in the exams, although once he heard of the reason why he understood. He had actually been good friend with Minato, and therefore with Kushina, so he understood Naruto's feeling of being rather touchy of the subject of family, his teammate and friend Jiraiya had been the same when they were Janan. As the Janan filed up onto the balconies they split into their teams, although Naruto and his team talked with teammate and the Kumo team about their journey through the forest. After around 15 minutes of waiting around as a pair of Chunin were entering their names into the match generator, the choosing of their matches began. Akadi Oroi vs Sai Aw oh man, you're so lucky, getting to go first, Naruto whined turning to Sai. Excuse me, but who has the best luck at gambling, 
you've almost become a gambling god, Sai retorted jokingly before turning and leaping over the railing. The others didn't say anything, they didn't need to, they knew what the outcome of this match was going to be. Meanwhile Naruto was muttering under his breath, ever since Tsunade had introduced him to gambling a few years ago, he hadn't lost a single bet, and in the casinos of Konoha they were referring to him as the Lord of Gambles. It's a completely ridiculous title. Naruto moaned mentally. Sai watched as his opponent walked down the steps from the opposite balcony, seeing if he could gain information on his fighting style by the way he walked and the way he stood. At the same time he was reviewing information that he had gleaned on this guy earlier in his head. He knew that his opponent had the ability to suck chakra from a person, he was essentially a chakra leech, but he had no information on how he was able to do this. It could be a long-range ninjutsu technique, or it could be a touch contact transfer, which Sai determined was more likely. Therefore this would be a taijutsu fight, as his opponent would try to stay in constant contact to avoid him using ninjutsu. Are both fighters ready? Hayate asked from the side. Sai nodded at one of the two jounins who had taught him kenjutsu, while Yoro didn't say anything. Hajime. Sai waited to see if his prediction was correct, and was proven that it was when Yoro moved back a few paces and gripped his right wrist with his left hand, before his hand was covered in a dull glow. When Yoro looked back up at Sai, having been concentrating on his hand, he saw that he had disappeared, and immediately began looking around in an attempt to find him. He found him a few minutes later, sitting upside down on the ceiling and drawing. Yoroi prepared to jump after him, but before he could do so he heard Sai's voice. Ink style, lightning ink panther. The eyes of many watching Shinobi widened as they saw a huge panther made of ink assemble itself from the pages of Sai's book, then after it was completed blue lightning began to flow along the lines of ink. That is a unique fighting style, Orochimaru thought and it would be difficult to defeat due to the odd element. Everyone watched as the panther ran across the ceiling and down a wall before leaping at Yoroi, who quickly dodged it, unsure if he should attack due to the lightning flowing across the ink construct. However he wasn't given much time to think of a strategy as the panther began to hunt him relentlessly, driving him towards a corner and forcing to defend against it rather than move out of the way. Yoroi knew he had made the wrong move as the panther impacted against his arms and the lightning flowed from the panther to him causing all of his upper body muscles to contract and seize up. Sai then lazily shunshined behind him and knocked him out, before leaving Yoroi for the Med Nin's present to pick up, going back up to his team. Well it seems that somebody has had a few new ideas, Yugi Ito thought as she regarded Sai relaxing with his team. Shukaku is screaming for that boy's blood as well, but not as much as Uzumaki's, Gaia thought as she glared at Team 7. Abumi Zaku vs Aburame Shino. Shino looked up at the sound team on the other balcony examining the Janan he was about to face. One of his arms was in a cast, obviously having been injured in an encounter in the forest of death. The two were quiet as they made their way onto the floor and facing each other. It is illogical to fight in the condition that you are in, Abumi-san, Shino said, mouth unseen behind his collar. Are both fighters ready? Hayate asked, and didn't receive a response, so he started the match. Zaku immediately went on the offensive, trying to blast Shino away with a sound jutsu. This was negated by Shino when it was revealed that Shino was a bug clone. Zaku, immediately turned around to find Shino standing quietly behind him, and was about to try and hit him again before Shino spoke. It is over Abumi-san, if you attack me then you shall be overwhelmed by my bugs behind you from my clone, and if you attack them then I will be able to knock you out or kill you. Zaku looked behind him to see that Shino was speaking the truth, there was a massive chakra leeching bugs behind him. Zaku sighed before he spoke. And whoever said that I wasn't able to use both of my arms? While he said this he unraveled the sling holding up his left arm and aimed it at the bugs, while he had his right arm pointed at Shino. Shino made no attempt to move and spoke quietly. I really wouldn't do that if I were you. Zaku ignored him and roared as he activated his sound jutsu, or at least tried to. Sakura and Team 10 gasped in horror as Zaku's arms imploded, while everyone else remained quiet. Shino explained to Zaku what he had done before Zaku blacked out from blood loss and sheer pain. I really wish he hadn't done that. Zaku, his team and my sound four are among the few that I'd trust completely, Orochimaru thought. Still, I can't blame him, it was a very good strategy. Konkuro vs Tsurugimi Sumi. Naruto and the other contenders watched what seemed to be a game of dares between the Sand and Konohanin. Eventually Misumi moved in and engaged in a taijutsu match with the puppeteer. After a few blows they paused with their hands still connected in the guard. All of a sudden, Misumi seemed to flow in a rather disproportionate manner, as if something had changed with his skeletal structure. I'll have you know that I am able to dislocate every joint in my body, allowing me to restrain and defeat my opponent by snapping their neck, 
Misumi said, now holding Konkuro in a choke hold while his legs were restraining Konkuro's limbs. I suggest that you surrender before I am forced to take your life. I will not hesitate to do so if necessary, Misumi continued. I will not surrender, Konkuro growled out furiously. Everyone apart from the sand team looked concerned, it seemed that Konkuro would be the first to die in the preliminaries. Misumi just shrugged and proceeded to break Konkuro's neck, and hung on as Konkuro's head slumped. Oddly, after Konkuro's head was bowed, small pieces seemed to be falling from his face. Hayate stepped forward to announce the match. Due to his opponent he was interrupted as Konkuro straightened and showed that it wasn't Konkuro Misumi had killed, but his puppet. The puppet's head spun around and stared straight at Misumi, creeping the hell out of him, before metallic ropes and wires wrapped around his body keeping him anchored to the puppet. The huge package fell off of the puppet's back, unwrapping itself to reveal that Konkuro had been in there the entire time and was controlling his puppet with chakra strings through the bandages. He then proceeded to use his puppet to break Misumi's bones one by one. After releasing him from the puppet, Hayate announced the match and Medic Nin came and took Misumi off to the hospital. Thank God I was hesitant in announcing the match earlier, Hayate thought, knowing of the ribbing he could have received from such an outcome. Well that was a short match. Sai said as he turned to face his team while leaning on the rail. Yes, although if Konkuro's opponent had used ninjutsu, he would have been in trouble, as it takes time to unravel himself, and inside he was trapped, unable to move, Ino contributed. Kanako smiled as she watched her team discuss the recent matches. It reminded her of her own time as a Jinan, although that was rather short. Everyone's attention was grabbed as the match generator landed on two names. Both names knew the other, in fact they had been very good friends in the past, but that was in the past. Yamanaka Ino vs Haruno Sakura. Both girls looked at each other along the first of the collective balconies before walking slowly down the stairs to the arena. I know that I need to concentrate on my training after the incident we had in the forest, but I don't know if I can fight Ino, after all she has been training with an s rank ninja. But I can't just quit, Sakura thought worriedly as she made her way down. Ino just steeled herself for the beating she was about to inflict on a former friend, Hajime. At the cry for them to begin. Sakura immediately created a few basic clones in an effort to try and distract Ino, but Ino had seen it coming from the third hand seal, by which time the type of jutsu could be told. She discarded the other clones, moving in behind Sakura with a seal less shunshine, surprising many members of the crowd. However Sakura had managed to guess where Ino would shunshine to and quickly moved out of the way of her incoming strikes. Ino continued her barrage, moving forward and back into striking range very quickly. Eventually Ino got through smashing her palm into Sakura's solar plexus, and the match was over very quickly after that, with Ino knocking Sakura out with the blunt end of a kunai. Over on the balcony Asuma watched as Sakura was having the crap beaten out of her, and was quickly becoming rather ashamed at his laziness at being a sensei. He reflected over his time with his team so far and realized he had spent more time playing Shikamaru and Shogi than training the other two members of his team. That was all well and fine for the genius, as he could adapt to pretty much all situations, but for the other two it was downright appalling. However there was the issue of Ino being on a team with two S rank ninja and the last being at A rank, but even so, anyone here could probably beat Sakura in a fight. He vowed that he would spend the time over the month before the Chunin exam finals to train Sakura and Choji, both of whom he doubted would qualify for the event. Team 7 just nodded their head, the fight had confirmed their thoughts, it was rather obvious in the light of the scene that Asuma hadn't been training his Janan properly. And Kanako mused that if she had the chance, she could try and train Sakura over the next month, along with Haku and Kurino, as Naruto had told her that Sakura had realized she needed the training while in the forest of death. She would have the time to spare, as no one in her current team would be trained by her, as that would be showing favoritism in her books, instead they were going to be trained by members of the Anbu that had trained Naruto and Sai while the former was in the academy. Tenten vs Tamari Damn that is probably the worst match for Tenten, Naruto said as he looked at the match generator. All the others nodded in agreement. Tenten relied on distance weapons and she was about to go up against a wind user. Although if she managed to close the gap she had a good chance, as Tamari, to their information, wasn't very good on close combat. Sure she could hold her own in taijutsu, but she wouldn't sacrifice her fan for a kenjutsu match. Tenten walked down the stairs stolidly, from what she had seen from the sand team and Tamari from watching a battle of theirs while in the forest, Tamari had a wind affinity. God damn it, this is going to be a tough battle. She thought determinedly. Tamari knew little of Tenten's skill but was confident that she would win, with the exception of the team of Konoha's Deathly Angel and perhaps the primary Kumo team. The team from Suno was probably the strongest contender for becoming Chunin's. Hajime. Tenten immediately jumped back, flinging Kunai at Tamari, hoping to catch her off guard. 
Tamari in response quickly pulled her huge fan off of her back and used a wide-range winjutsu to disrupt the flight of the sharp metal objects heading her way. This had the extra effect of buffeting Ten Ten into the wall of the room behind her. Ten Ten used the opportunity to shunshine behind Tamari, succeeding in bypassing her main defense of wind justice in order to attack close in. Quickly unsealing a katana from one of her storage scrolls, Ten Ten immediately went on the attack, forcing Tamari to dodge as best as she could, not wanting her fan, which was the conductor of many of her jutsus, to be shredded by the sharp blade. This went on for a while with both Team 7 and 9 feeling confident of Tenten's victory now that she had closed the gap, before Tamari managed to remake it by using her own shunshine to get out of trouble. Tenten, feeling less confident now, as she knew that her previous tactic wouldn't work twice, resealed her katana and pulled out two scrolls which she threw above her and began to spiral down and around her. She jumped up before unsealing weapons sealed with the spiraling scrolls and throwing them at Tamari but none of them managed to get through her winjutsu. Eventually Tamari had enough playing around and used a strong gust of wind chakra to blow Tenten -ten from her position, all the weapons in the air raining down harmlessly on the floor. She then used what looked to be a small tornado jutsu in which Tenten -ten was captured and cut all over her body repeatedly. After about 30 seconds of Tenten -ten by cut relentlessly by the jutsu, Tamari ran out of chakra to continue and released it, at the same time moving under Tenten's rapidly falling body. Naruto seeing that Tenten -ten was going to injure her spine unnecessarily on impact with Tamari's fan, moved quickly, speeding over the railing and catching Tenten -ten while standing on one foot on the end of the fan. Tamari saw little more than a blur, before she saw Naruto setting down Tenten -ten on the balcony with her team. Walking stiffly up the steps, everyone was discussing the match, not seeing Naruto's Sharingan activate accidentally in anger as he glared at Tamari's back. Narashikamaru vs Tsuchikin Well, this is going to be boring. Naruto commented on the matchup. Yeah, you don't say. Shika will win, but he'll somehow manage to do it in the most boring way possible, Sai said, laughter clear in his voice. However the attention of Team 7 was grabbed when Haku and Kurino walked along the balcony towards them, having slipped into the room earlier after gaining permission to watch the prelims. What are you two doing here? Kanako asked, taking her eyes off of her book briefly. Well we managed to get permission to watch from the Hokage and the children are being watched over by Nico, Iviki, and Anko, Kurino said, before asking about the previous matches. Kanako then told them of the results and winning moves, before mentioning her plans for perhaps having Sakura train with them for the next month. If she wants to and is willing to train hard, then I have no problems with it sensei, Haku said after hearing of it, but was slightly doubtful, after all this was a fangirl they were talking about. Kurino made a motion of agreement with her before they realized that Shikamaru's match was over, him having won by knocking Ken out on the wall behind her. Kiba vs Samui Both competitors grinned as they saw each other's names on the match generator. They had been looking forward to their spar against the other teams that had been present in Wave, and this was the first matching of any of the members of the three teams. Kiba and Samui jumped into the arena, and took their places opposite each other, knowing that the other had been training ever since their collective mission, and that either way it would be a tough match. Hajime The members of Team 7 and 8 and the primary Kumo team all leaned forward, eager to see the progress of their two friends. Kiba leapt forward, Samui was caught slightly off guard by his new speed, but was able to dodge his tackle in time, and withdrew her tondo as Kiba turned back towards her. Kiba stared at her for a few moments, assessing his chances, before he sighed and backed off slightly. I had hoped that I would be able to reveal these later, but if I don't now, I will just be wasting my time against you, Kiba said, pulling off a set of weights that had been hidden under his jacket and pants, causing a minor dust cloud. Samui's eyes widened slightly. I was barely able to avoid him before, and he was wearing weights. Kiba moved forward once more, this time slightly faster, forcing Samui to dive to one side. However, as he passed her, her tanto whipped out quickly, cutting into his right arm slightly. He considered the cut, before shrugging, deciding that it wasn't too serious. While he was doing so, Samui was focusing and trying channel her chakra in order to use a lightning technique to try and slow Kiba down, but she had an alternative idea. Why not use lightning chakra on herself and speed up to his level instead? Determined to try this new idea Samui focused her lightning nature chakra to her legs, knowing that if this worked, it would likely win her the match. As she stepped off towards the Inuzuka she accidentally released her chakra in a burst. Shit, I lost focus. She cursed before realizing that the side effect was she had effectively shot off at high speed towards the mystified boy. Samui smiled slightly. It seemed that her mistake had done what she was initially aiming for. Naruto and the others watched as the match became a high-speed taijutsu battle, with only Naruto and Kanako working out what Samui had done had been a mistake, 
but one that she started to use as an actual technique. Hmm, if he masters use of that mistaken technique and speed herself up at the same time, she has the potential to be on the level of the Yondai Meirakage, Kanako mused while watching the two. Eventually Kiba withdrew and used Suga, the rotation drill technique that he had used against Kuro in their spar and wave. However as he sped towards Samui, he had no idea that Samui had swapped with the Raibunshine that she had created due to the high speed rotations of his technique. Thus when he impacted with her Bunshine, he got the shock of his life, quite literally. When he stopped spinning, he was unable to move at his normal speed, the lightning chakra causing his limbs to seize up. Well it seems that Samui has outsmarted Kiba, Naruto said as he turned back to his team who nodded in agreement. Hayuga Hinata vs Hayuga Neji. At the result that the match generator had given, many amongst the Konoha shinobi looked concerned, many, especially the higher-ups, knew of Neji's hate for the main branch of the Hayuga clan. Neji blamed Hinata for his father's death, due to him being sacrificed so that Hiyashi, the current clan head and Neji's uncle, could live. He was also set against the main family due to their cursed seal that they forced upon the branch family, which allowed them to control the branch members even allowing them to inflict pain without reprisal. Guy watched grimly as his student descended into the arena, knowing that Neji's anger would most likely get the better of him, as did all of the Konoha senseis, Naruto and Sai. Ino knew of Neji's hate for the main family, but didn't know how deep it ran, so was more concerned with the outcome of the match rather than Hinata's survival. Hajime, right from the start, everyone who was watching closely could see Neji's anger beginning to release itself as he and Hinata matched each other blow for blow. Eventually Neji began to pull ahead as he forced Hinata on the defensive, raining down the deadly strikes of the gentle fist, while Hinata did her best to block them with her injuries forcing her to draw back several times. Several times Neji landed shots on her torso, causing Hinata to collapse to her knees while he began to belittle her, causing anger to flare among some of the spectators, mainly Kurinai, Kanako, Hiruzen, Naruto, Sai and Kurino. However he finally lost any pretense of calm as he witnessed Hinata slowly rise and challenge him once more, charging at her with the intent to kill, even though she was in no position to fight once more. As he charged her with his Byakugan blazing in anger, several blurs leapt over the balcony to intervene, as Hayate did the same. All of the spectators were treated to both Naruto and Sai having Neji at sword point, with Naruto's ninjutos crossing in front of his throat and Sai holding his leading hand while his tanto was above Neji's heart while Sai was crouching. The Jounin immediately moved forward to defuse the situation, although Hayate and Kurinai, along with Kurino, were more concerned for Hinata's safety and recovery. The medic nin had begun moving into the arena as soon as they saw Neji being detained. So even now the main family gets preferential treatment, Neji spat bitterly. She was wounded, and you were intending to kill her even after you had humiliated her in front of the Hokage. But now you are just humiliating yourself by acting this way. Also did the thought ever occur to you that not once did she activate your cage bird seal, even though it was fully within her right as the heiress. You humiliated her, and she still insisted on fighting you properly, not resorting to that. She honored you, did you ever think of that? Naruto asked, as his eyes started to blaze in anger. Due to Hayuga Hinata being in critical condition, Hayuga Neji is the victor, Hayate announced after the Jounin Sensei's had managed to convince Naruto and Sai to release Neji. The Jounin, Naruto and Sai remained in the arena as the match generator started to flick through names once more, before landing on two that made Naruto grin. Uzumaki Naruto vs Narujaku Naruto immediately turned to the Hokage as his opponent, Ataki Janan descended slowly into the arena. Hokage-sama, permission to release ice? The Hokage pondered the question before nodding in acquiescence believing the time was right for Naruto to start revealing his special abilities. Naruto grinned as he turned to face his opponent, as did all the Konoha Jounin present apart from Asuma, as most had either been involved in training Naruto or had worked with him on a mission. Naruto it seemed would be going up a very large Jounin who wielded a Zanbatu a bit like Haku's, and was obviously more focused on pure strength rather than speed, shown by the pieces of samurai-like armor he wore. Naruto grinned, bringing down the sword was a very dear pastime to him as he liked to show them why strength without speed was useless, although in the past, by the time they learned that, it was already too late. Hajime, you may be Konoha's deathly angel, although I very much doubt that, but you are no match for my kanjutsu, well not with those twigs anyway, and water jutsu, which is the best for someone our age, Jagu boasted, unaware of the line he had stepped across. There was one thing Naruto hated, people doubting him as being Konoha's angel. And there was no doubt that that was what Jagu had just done. You will regret saying that, Naruto vowed. Ha, try and make me. Are you both ready to start? 
Hayate asked in a bored voice, the Takijanan had just signed his own death warrant. You know that am I more than ready, Naruto said, staring straight at Jagu, who just nodded, that stare was starting to unnerve him. Hajime. Naruto and Jagu just continued to stare at one another, racking up the tension. You know, since your strengths are in Kenjutsu and Water Jutsu, I will only fight you using those, Naruto glared. Fine by me, but expect not to win, Jagu chuckled pulling the Zanbatu off his back. Naruto made no move to unsheath his ninjutos, instead unsealing a black Okatana from a few Unjutsu seal on his wrist. I don't think that you're worth the use of my ninjutos, you wouldn't last long if I did use them, Naruto said, smiling thinly. Jagu immediately charged in, anger overwhelming his common sense, with his Zanbatu trailing across the ground, causing sparks to rise behind him. Naruto just stood calmly but his mind was racing through potential attack motions that Jagu could use. To the spectators they saw Jagu charging in, but the next moment they saw Jagu holding his face off to one side, Zanbata lying forgotten to one side, while Naruto had changed position, having turned his back to where Jagu had started the match from. What the hell happened? Kiba explained, confused as to what had happened. Kanako having used her Sharingan to capture the moment before analyzing it in her mind, explained. It seems that Jagu went for a massive downward strike putting all of his weight behind it. Then Naruto deflected it slightly to one side before trapping under his own sword. Kanako noticed that all on the balcony were listening into her explanation, he then kicked Jagu in the cheek, putting him off balance, before kicking the sword from his grasp. He was able to do that all in one move? Kiba asked, odd. There is a reason that some consider him a prodigy with the potential to be the greatest shinobi since the Rikadu Senin. He is the youngest person in history to be a bingo booker, and is the youngest person able to challenge two cage level shinobi at once, Kanako elaborated, slightly sad that Hirototo was a very good weapon when necessary. What? When did he do that? Konkuro asked in utter shock, while all the other Jinan were odd. He once challenged Jiraiya and Tsunade of the Sen into a duel, both of them against him. Only the Sandaime and the Tapanbu captains were permitted to watch, along with those who had trained him. Let's just say that he was able to knock the stuffing out of those two, although he did have to spend a while in the hospital afterwards, Kanako said, smiling slightly at the memory of Jiraiya's face. All of the Jinan returned to watching the match, it seemed that Naruto had waited patiently while Jagu recovered and the latter had decided to try his water ninjutsu instead, realizing that he was totally outclassed in Kenjutsu. I didn't even see him move, one second he was still as I charged, the next I was over here, Jagu thought, reaching for his flask on his belt. The flask was special to him as it had seals on it, which allowed it to be bigger on the inside, and was able to hold around 2.5 cubic meters of water. Opening the flask, Jagu allowed the water to pour out before preparing for a water jutsu. You will pay for that. Jagu roared, while Naruto just stared at him coldly once more. Water style, water bullets. Naruto watched passively as the water bullets sped towards him, before holding one hand out and channeling chakra through it, the result being that the bullets were now rings the centers having been blown out. Naruto then halted the rings and held them in midair with only his chakra, before closing his fist and reopening it. Haku and Kurino, along with Ino were shocked out of their minds as the rings turned from water to ice, this was the first they had heard of it, and the others thought it was one of his classified bloodlines. What none of them knew was that Naruto's Senju bloodline was a lot more than that. What ensued was a game of cat and mouse, Naruto was controlling the ice rings using chakra strings, while Jagu was doing his best to dodge and avoid them, as he had realized that they were very sharp when one scratched his cheek. There was just one problem, due to him cancelling his speed training, Jagu didn't have the reflexes or the flexibility necessary to dodge, and eventually Naruto got him into a position where he would lose both arms if he didn't surrender. He gave in. As Naruto jumped back up onto the balcony he saw the questioning gazes of Ino, Haku, and Kurino, and sighed. He knew he would have had to deal with this sooner or later. What was that? Haku asked fiercely. Later, Naruto replied, delaying his answer. Gaia vs Rock Lee. Oh this is going to be a tough one for both sides, Naruto whistled. Obviously you don't know what Gaia is capable of, Tamari remarked from the side. Oh I know very well what Gaia is capable of, I had a mission in Suna two years ago, and I was there when she crushed several of her friends into nothing more than blood. But the thing is, is that she has a reactive ultimate defense. So what happens when her opponent is faster than the defense? She won't be in getting through this without a scratch. It seems that it is time for her know the pain of her first injuries, Naruto commented, ignoring the outrage coming from the Suna Shinobi about him being on a mission there a few years ago. If there is one thing Lee is, it's fast, Sai added nodding. We should be quiet, this match will be legendary, 
Naruto said, leaning forward after pulling his hood up and discreetly activating his Sharingan. I look forward to fighting against a shinobi of such great strength, Lee declared as he faced Gaia, who was facing him quietly, looking more annoyed than anything else. Hajime, before Lee could do anything, Gaia removed the stopper from her gourd, and sand poured out. Over on the balcony Naruto just nodded, that action just proved his thoughts, Gaia relied on her sand defense too much. Lee quickly moved forward, at speed that were the fastest of the Shinan present, minus Naruto. Cyan perhaps Eno. You know. Leaf Hurricane. Lee's leg slammed into Gaia's sand defense, unable to get through and forcing Lee on the defensive, pulling out a kunai and slicing through the sand trying to smother him before he had to retreat. Tamari grinned, it seemed that Gaia had this in hand, and Naruto was wrong. But she didn't know of the weights that Lee wore. As Lee managed to escape from being crushed by Gaia's sand, he landed on the monument at the far end of the room, and he stayed before Gaia spoke up from his position on the balcony. Lee. Take them off. But Sensei, you said that the condition was only when I was protecting those very important to me or if it was necessary for a mission. Lee objected. This time I'll make an exception. Lee grinned slowly, before sitting down and pulling down his orange ankle warmers to reveal a pair of leg weights, and taking them off. Everyone apart from Lee, Guy, Kanako, Naruto, Sai, Neji, Tenten and Ino were aghast. This was his secret weapon? Oh come on. There is no way that is going to help. Tamari said. Frustrated by the idiocy of this competitor. Ah that is better. You should feel honored. The only ones to challenge me at our age when I take these off are Naruto, Sai, Neji and now you, Lee declared before dropping the weights. Everyone was out out of their minds when the weights impacted with the floor, they literally tore through an inch and a half of concrete before coming to a stop, and causing a massive dust cloud, and cracks to spiderweb for meters around the impact. The Hokage and many of the Jounin immediately looked at Guy as if he was insane before returning to the match eager to see how this was equalized the fight. Gaia just glared at Lee, undisturbed by the amount of weights Lee had been wearing, before her eyes widened as Lee disappeared to all but Team 7, Team 9 and the Jounin and Hokage. He reappeared behind Gaia, punching through his defense due to the speed he now possessed before disappearing once more, each time reappearing to punch or kick his way through the sand. Gaia was very, very scared, this was the fastest person she had ever faced, and now it looked like her sand wouldn't be able to keep up. Up on the balcony Konkuro, Tamari and Baki were having the same sort of thoughts. Eventually Lee got through and was able to scratch Gaia on the cheek, causing the Suna team to gasp in surprise that Gaia had finally been touched in battle. Even though it looked like Lee now had a chance, as he was too fast for Gaia, Gaia revealed that she was wearing sand armor, and that in actuality, she hadn't been touched, Lee had just scratched the armor. My Kami. Does this girl have any weaknesses? Kiba shouted in exasperation. Kid, if only you knew. That armor is one big weak spot, due to the amount of chakra that Gaia has to use to keep it on, Konkuro reflected, disturbed that she had resorted to the armor. During the course of the match, everyone was awed at some point or another due to the feats of the two shinobi in front of them. Lee used the primary lotus in order to try and bring Gaia down, but both Naruto and Kanako realized it was useless when they saw Gaia swap with a hollow sand clone just in time. This caused Lee to destroy his muscles, while Gaia bypassed his technique, and eventually paid him back in pain driving Naruto close to intervening with the match. Then everyone was awed when Lee managed to open the first five celestial chakra gates through sheer effort, a feat thought impossible, and then proceeded to beat Gaia around the arena before activating the hidden lotus. This time he caught Gaia but she managed to soften her fall by turning her gourd itself into sand, even though she still bore the brunt of the impact, being sent through the concrete floor several feet thick. As such Gaia was still able to send her sand after Lee while she healed, while Lee was unable to move his muscles having shredded themselves during the technique, and she was able to crush his left leg and arm. Then Naruto and Guy intervened, Guy stopping her from completely crushing his student, while Naruto stopped her and threatened her that if she didn't stop, he would never heal Shukaku. Guy just froze before getting up and shun shining back to the balcony. This is odd, it seems that he is suggesting that there is something wrong with Shukaku, as if he shouldn't be like this, but he has always been this way, so how would he know the difference, how could he even come to that conclusion? The only ones that would know would be the Baiju, unless... No. He isn't in Chiriki. Gaia thought frantically, ignoring the remarks of her sister. She realized that if anyone would be able to help her, he would, after all it sounded like he was on good terms with his Baiju, and he had offered to fix her seal for her, did he not? Naruto watched as Amoe and Yugito quickly and efficiently demolished their opponents, teammates of Jagu from Taki. He wasn't really paying attention, thinking over the match between Gaia and Lee and the possible consequences. After all, he had interfered in all three matches of Team 9, 
and even he couldn't get away with that without consequences, and at the same time he would have to tell the Hokage about Haku's and Kurino's curiosity involving his bloodline and heritage, better they hear from him than others. Although on the plus side, he could stop living a lie to his own village in just over a month, along with the fact that the finals were going to be exciting. The son Daime had something special planned for an exhibition of his skills. As such he stayed behind to talk with the son Daime along with his team, Kurino and Haku as he had told Kanako earlier about their interest, and she had decided that it was probably time for Ino to learn as well. Hokage-sama, I and the others of my team, including the two attaches, would like to speak to you privately in your office concerning my heritage and bloodlines, Naruto said, kneeling. Hiruzen was silent before responding. Very well, let us go and with it the seven of them shunshined into his office. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.